There's probably going to be some advice, some things you hear where your mind's going to say, "Ah, you know what, that's a little out there. I don't know if I agree with that. That kind of challenges what I currently believe. It kind of challenges the way I currently go about doing things. And my answer to that is great. If you're not being challenged here, if everything you're hearing is just reinforcing what you know, you're not going to grow. And you're going to keep doing the same things over and over again, and nothing will change. During this seminar, you better be triggered. You better be challenged. And you better try it. If you don't change your approach radically, nothing will change. And it's easy to see it in others. Have you ever tried showing this stuff to your friends? What's their reaction? Are they like, oh, this is great. No, they're like, self-help? Do I look like I need help? Why are you into this weird stuff? I mean, look, look at this guy. You're, you're listening to this weirdo? And you're like, but don't you see the value? Yeah, but look at his glasses. You're like, but the value, they block it off. It's so easy to see it in others. However, the question to ask yourself here is, what is my version of that? What are you currently closed off to? One thing I was closed off to for a long period of time was some of the things we're going to talk about here, some of the deep inner work. I always thought that was like, oh, that's just lazy people. Inner work are the slackers, the people who just sit at home and just, oh, inner work because they don't want to take action. That was my view for a very long time, and boy, was I wrong. Of course you must take action, but if you ignore the inner work side, self-sabotage will get you, and instead of taking smart action, you will take stupid action. I was one of those people who was closed off. And it's a continual process. You must always, always work on remaining open, on challenging what you know and challenging what you do. Be careful not to look for content to reinforce it. Okay? So have an open mind going into this. Who am I? I've been traveling around the world since 2010. Okay, I got into personal development. I got into working on myself in 2006, but in 2010, I started traveling around the world, teaching literally tens of thousands of people face-to-face and millions online. What does this mean? I am not, and I'll repeat, I am not a little YouTuber or social media influencer. No, screw that. It's funny, he's like, oh, it's fun. You know, you put your little YouTube videos up. I'm like, I do, but that's not my job. My job is real, in-person, transformational work. Because most people today on YouTube, what do they do? They just read a few books, they're in their little crappy apartment, and they put some videos out. Like, hey, hey gang, I read this book, and here's some great advice for procrastination, gang. Till next time, gang. And they have no experience. It's like, oh, you know, I I coached a couple um, people on YouTube and through Skype, gang. Yeah, but did you go out in the real world? No, I'm just here in my mom's basement making videos, but they sure help. Okay, no. My work is in-person work. I've traveled everywhere. I've seen it all. Literally everywhere. It's like, have you been there? Yep. Can you still go there? Eh, Well, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) But I have been there. And I've literally seen it all. Like any type of person, any type of age, any type of background, job, issue. I mean, you name it. What does that mean for you? I've met you before. Now, not all of you, there's some of you like, no, you're not, I wasn't even born back then. (laughs) Joking. I've met someone just like you before. I've seen it. Whatever you say at this point, I've heard it before. There's nothing that surprises me. Uh, And I've worked on someone and got someone through it before. Okay, so I know you and I used to be you. It's easy to see me now and I hear it. People are like, you know, Julian, it's really inspiring and all, but I mean, look at you. Look at how cool you are. It's easy for you. Look at how good looking you are. It's easy for you. I mean, you're literally the most good look I'd be you, you know? (laughs) I never used to be this amazing, this godlike, this superior. I used to be an inferior being, just like yourself in this, and I'm kidding. (laughs) But this used to be me. (laughs) I'm just like, oh my God. Yes. Is that the smile of someone who is radiating life who's excited to be alive, who is present, who's like, here I am. Or is that the smile of someone saying, kill me? <laughs> what do you think? Okay. I used to be extremely shy. I, I mean, for real, I was nervous around like family gatherings. You might've heard me talk about this in a couple of speeches before where 
literally, you know, family, like a holiday, a vacation was coming. I'm like, aunts and uncles, grandparents, everyone would get together for a big meal, and I would have anxiety over that. That's how bad it was. It's like, so, uh, what are you afraid of? Yeah, you know, the holidays? <laughs> Holiday meals? Why? Because everyone asks you, so Julian, what's new with you? And everyone stares. And just that, family members staring at me would stifle me. It's like, so what's new with you? Why are you being so quiet, Julian? Can't you talk? You shy? No. <laughs> so speak up. What's new? It was horrible. Okay, I would be stifled there. Um, my first, like, I'd say couple months or so, going out and trying to work on myself and trying to work on my social skills, I couldn't even ask an old person for the time. That's how bad it was. You know, I found out about this. It's like, oh, you know, you can actually work on this. You don't have to be nervous at every family meal ever again. I'm like, that is great. Let's baby step it. Let's just go out and ask someone for the time. That's it. And I remember I took my watch off. I'm like, make sure they don't see the watch on. And let's find the nicest looking person, the most innocent, friendly looking person, an old person. And I literally went out. I'm from Switzerland, so I went out in uh, Lausanne. And I would walk around the streets, and I couldn't ask anyone for the time. That's how bad it was. And it was there, like, there's an old person walking up. I'm like, here we go. And I'm sure you've all felt that. The adrenaline kicks in. You're like, we're doing it. We're doing it. And as soon as they arrive, oh, and then the self-attack, stupid, why didn't you ask them for the time? And then what do we do? We're like, well, it's not too late. And I turn around and I start following the old person, <laughs> following them to stores and stuff. I'm like hiding them. I'm like, here we go. Got to ask for the time. Everyone's like, who's this person? Like, who's this guy following old people? That was me. And it was like months of this. And I was unable to take action, unable to even ask someone for the time. It was horrible. And the self-attack and disappointment was horrible. And I'm sure you can relate. You ever have that where it's like, you just know you could do better, but ah, there's that blockage and you can't overcome it. You get home end of the day at night and it's just like the saddest night of your life. It's just like, oh, I'm the most pathetic being. Cry yourself into your pillow. I've done it. I know you've done it too. We've all done it. Be proud. Here, just cry themselves to sleep in their pillow there. Like, ah, you stupid. Yeah, it's more than you. And then it's like, well, I still got my hand. But... <laughs> But yeah, that was me. Um, I would not show up at an event like this, and if I did, I'd be someone sitting in the back hoping that no one talked to me. It'd be so anxiety-provoking, it was horrible. Now, as I mentioned before, seeing me here, it's hard to be like, is that true? Yes, it was. It was bad. Okay, you would not recognize me back then. And I went from that to living the life of my dreams, literally. This here, my current life, is the old me's vision board. You ever have that? Like, oh, my vision board, what would my dream life look like? It's my life now. And if I can do it, being so shy, so stifled, so anxious, with that haircut, so can you. Okay, no one is cut from a different cloth. And I've done it around the world, as I mentioned, with every type of person. Just looking at you here, you're probably not the best that I've seen, but you're definitely not the worst. <laughs> Someone's like, thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was far worse than a lot of you. And if you ever bump into some people that I knew from back in the day, they can definitely confirm it. It was bad. It was really bad. Okay. So to do this, okay, what changed? What are the things you need to truly change? If I boil it down to the foundations, okay, to the essential things you need, it's only two, okay? The first is accountability, okay? That's the first thing. If you don't have accountability, good luck. This is what finally allowed me to take action. Just this alone. Not even knowing what to do or say, just the accountability factor, okay? What creates accountability? People and money, those are the two things. If there's any area of your life right now where you're like, oh, I'm just not executing on it, involve people and involve money and you will, okay? So for me, I realized that. I'm like, you know what, I'm just going out, following these old people in the streets, it's kind of weird, it's been a couple months, people are starting to recognize me, gotta do something about it. And I went online and I found people who were also working on their social skills. And I met up with them. 
It was three people. They were very weird, but I was weird as well. And we met up and uh, we started going up and working on our social skills, saying hi to people. And they were all doing it. I was the guy who couldn't even ask someone for the time, and they were just going up, just chatting, everyone having a blast. Now, because I was in that environment with them, it created a situation where I didn't have a choice. Why? Because for me, I was extremely attached to what people thought of me. That's why during the street alone, I'm like, oh, what are people thinking? Oh, this is so bad. I'm asking someone for the time. It's horrible. It's the worst thing you could do. That's what was in my mind. Now that I'm in this circle, the three people who I was with, they were doing it. What happens if I don't do it? What are they going to think? Oh, they're going to think I'm a loser. I better do it. And it tipped the seesaw of motivation to the point where I just jumped in and finally took action. Without them, I wouldn't. Okay, surrounding yourself with people who hold you accountable. I'm sure you've experienced this. If it's you by yourself with yourself, your mind is very good at talking you out of things. It's very good at rationalizing. You ever have it? There's like this important thing you have to do and you're sitting down, you're like, okay, it's Monday. We've been telling ourselves all week we're gonna start on Monday. Today is the day. And Monday's there, and you sit down to do that task, to do that thing, and your little voice you know, kicks in, and it's like, so I know it's Monday, but you know this new show on Netflix came out today? And you're like, shut up, mind. I told myself I would work on this thing today. It's like, I know, and we're still going to work, but I just want to put it out there. You know, this, that show looked pretty good from what we saw. It did look pretty good, but, you know, we, we got to work on this. Okay, let's work on it. But let me ask you this. What happens if we don't work on this right now? Well, it's not good. We told ourselves for an entire week we'd be working on it today. Yeah, but just play along here. What if you don't? Are we going to die? Well, no. Is anything bad really going to happen? Well, no, but, you know, it's personal integrity. Yeah, but we could always do it tomorrow. So technically, nothing happens if we don't do this now, right? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, well, let's do the task. We could also just watch five minutes of that Netflix show. What's well, five minutes, right? It's nothing, just five minutes, and then you know what, we'll feel refreshed. It's kind of what we need. Right now we're in this heavy state, you know, thinking about Netflix and working. I feel like the Netflix would just uh, kind of loosen us up so we can get to work. Let's do five minutes. You sit down, you put on the five minutes. Five minutes pass, and you're like, man, I know five minutes pass, but this episode's sure good. <laughs> kind of want to know what happens. Okay, let's just finish that one episode, right? 35 minutes left, that's it. And then we'll do the task, okay? 35 minutes. What happens after 35 minutes? Netflix gets you. It immediately plays the next episode. <laughs> You're like, no, one more. And what happens? It just keeps on going. You put it off till the next day, and then the next day you're like, you know what? This week's already ruined. Let's wait till next Monday. <laughs> that's what your mind does if it's just you and yourself. If you don't do it, no one knows. But if you involve other people, it does play on the ego a bit. But now, you can't look stupid. But what will they think? Okay, so involving people is key. Money will do the same thing. If you want a quick little tip right now, whatever it is you're procrastinating on, if you give a certain amount of money to a friend, say you give a thousand bucks to your friend, and you tell your friend, if I don't do that thing, you keep the thousand bucks. Are you going to do it? Yeah. Literally. Whatever it is. Just... The, what's the hard part there? It's just giving that person a thousand bucks. It's like, here. And now it's like you're, you literally created a situation where you don't have a choice. And that's a lot of what success is. Now, funny enough, we tend to believe that oh, we need all this discipline and willpower and hustle, but not really, right? This is the thing that successful people get that unsuccessful people don't get. Success really boils down to identifying key moments, key decisions, key action steps, and then just doing the right thing. So for example, that whole thing you're procrastinating on, you're spending hours like, oh, I should do it, the Netflix, the, uh. if you just went, here's a thousand bucks to your friend, it's like, if I don't do it, you keep it. Now you don't need any willpower. Now you're gonna do it. The hard part is that one second, it just lasts a second of just being like, here, that's it. And that's what a lot of success is. It's being smart, placing yourself in situations where action is inevitable, and it's like those one-second moments, those key decisions. And we make a ton of them. How many decisions do you make this week? Thousands. How many change your lives? None. <laughs> okay. So money and people. 
you must surround yourself with people who hold yourself accountable and put yourself in the situations. If you go through my phone through in WhatsApp, it's accountability group after accountability group. I would not be here if I didn't have people who held me accountable. Surround yourself with people who also believe in you. This is extremely powerful. Okay, a key quote to write down. Sometimes all it takes is just one person who believes in you. That can make the entire difference. I've seen it online. I have different programs that have like VIP Facebook groups and someone's like, oh, you know what, I'm having trouble with this assignment. And a stranger, not even me, not even one of my coaches, just a stranger comments, hey, you got this. Just that. Something as simple as, you got this, a little thumbs up. Or, I believe in you, you can do it. Just that makes the whole difference. Why? Because now it's all long, no longer just you with yourself. You're like, wow, that person actually believes in me. If they believe in me, I can believe in me. Because it's, I mean, if you feel like the world is against you, it's very, very hard to take action. It just feels like you're constantly battling against this thing. And having people who believe in you can change everything. Okay, that also means identify people who don't believe in you and perhaps be aware of how much time you're spending with them because that will affect you as well. Okay, find people who are where you are in life and model them, work with them. That is how you get good fast on top of accountability, on top of people who believe in you, AKA get a mentor. You've heard this before, that's really the magic pill when it comes to this type of work. This is what I did. I surrounded myself with Owen. As you can see up here, our two little skinny pale bodies in Miami Beach <laughs> back in the day. Um, the people I work with, all the different instructors, we all hold each other accountable. My coaches and I, we hold each other accountable. I do it. Why do you think you might be different or the exception to this rule? It's as simple as that. Be very smart of who you hang out with. Now, in terms of doing it, there are three rules. The first is respect yourself. What does this mean? We are very, very good at tolerating mediocrity, at tolerating failure. That's another thing your mind will do. It's not that bad, right? Yeah, you failed, but hey, if your life is just a complete mess, it's not that bad. This is now your comfort zone. Failure becomes your comfort zone. You must respect yourself. You need to be the biggest deal for you in your life right now. Now here's a perspective to sink into. This is one of my favorite perspectives to sink into. Take one thing you've been putting off right now. One thing, there's that resistance, whether it's procrastination, whether it's fear, it's that thing you know if you did it, your life would improve. What's one thing if you did it right now, your life would improve? Think about it. And then it's like, why have I not been doing that? Now let's just say, right now in this moment, you were transported in jail. That's the perspective I like. You're transported in jail, and uh, what's your name, young man? Patrick? Yeah. You're in jail right now, Patrick, and you're surrounded by big thugs. Not friendly people, just big thugs. Um, one has a tattoo saying, every STD with an arrow. The other has a tattoo saying, AIDS with an arrow, and they're coming up to you. They're like, Patrick, you seem quiet. You have a good physique. You seem very, your skin seems very soft, Patrick. Uh, do you want some soap to drop, maybe? <laughs> um, and they're coming in. You know it's about to happen. And let's just say I appear on the other side. I'm like, Patrick, for you to get out of jail, you just got to do that one thing. Are you going to do it? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Why? Because it's a big deal. You know? It's crazy how we limit ourselves. We stay stuck and we limit ourselves. I see it at um, different live events that I do. You know, I tend to do, um, if I travel on Thursday, I'll do a free event. And then on Saturday, I'll do a paid event that's uh, Transformation Mastery Live. Who here has been to Transformation Mastery Live before? Raise your hand. Nice. Did one in Paris earlier this year, which was amazing. Um, but that's a cheap event, okay? It's 300 bucks. Well, 297. And I find it baffling when people are like, but Julian, I don't have 297. I'm like, what are you doing here? Are you an adult? That's the first thing I say, because that is pathetic if you don't have 297 handy. Pathetic. A lack of self-respect, which we're going to get to. But as soon as I put them in that scenario, it's like, okay, you don't have 297. Say you're in that same scenario. It's like, Patrick, you're in jail. They're coming in. Snakes are flying in. STDs, AIDS coming your way. And I'm like, hey, Patrick, you want to get out? 
297. Will you find the money? Yes. You will do whatever it takes because that situation is a big deal. Now the question for you is why are you not as much of a big deal? Why does it take you being in jail to be like, this is very important. Why don't you respect yourself more? Why is it that in every situation in life you're just doing and taking that action by default because you consider yourself a big deal? Too many people lack self-respect. They've convinced themselves that their mediocre life is good enough. They've gotten used to it. It's become their comfort zone and they're just stuck. Okay, so rule number one, respect yourself. Rule number two, be resourceful. You're not as stuck as you think. If right now, just think about it, if you're in jail and say the bail was 297, 300 bucks, that's it. And in your mind you're like, well if I was in jail I could probably find that money. Why are you not doing that now? If there's something you can do right now to inject some money into your life, why are you not doing it? Right? Think about it. Just try to think of one thing you could do right now to inject extra money in your life. If you can think of it, you're screwing up. Why are you not doing it? Lack of self-respect. We also have a lot of limitations and blind spots when it comes to improving our life and making money. You know, I see it, uh, I mean, here's, here's an example. Okay, that 297. Go work for Uber. Go babysit. Go and walk up to people in the street and say, hey, I'll sing you a song for 10 bucks. If you did that every day, by the way, you'd make easily an extra 50 to 100 bucks a day. Just doing that. Why? Because people will be curious. Say you're in the street and someone walks up like, hey, I got the best song ever, 10 bucks and I'll sing it for you. You're like, I doubt it's that good, but I'm very curious. What is this song? And then it can just suck. You know, you're like, well, it was this, but you got the money. You could literally walk and just go up to people like 10 bucks for a song, 10 bucks for a song. Now you got an extra 100 bucks a day. Right? Yet people are like, oh, I'm just so broke. I don't have the money. No, you're just not being resourceful enough. Same with Uber. Oh, but you know what? I'm above that. That's what people think. No, put your ego aside. Do whatever it takes. Saying I'm above that is a pathetic excuse to continue to disrespect yourself. Okay, that's what I did when I met Owen, by the way. People were like, oh, did you just start hanging out with him and helping out? In a way, but there were certain requirements. You know, I'd see him in Los Angeles, and he was looking for someone to help out. And uh, I was like, hey, man, I'd love to help out. And we sat down and we talked, and it was over multiple, um, you know, you could say interviews. And on the last one, he's like, you know what? You're a great fit. We see each other out. We have a good time. We think alike. Let's do this. There's one condition, though. In order to help out, you have to have a car. You got a car, Julian? Did I have a car? No. When I first moved to Los Angeles, what was my life situation? I was pretty much homeless. I was sleeping on the living room floor <laughs> in this one bedroom apartment with three other guys. That was my life situation. I was making $8 an hour working at Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf, which is like a Starbucks. I was a barista. And I maybe had 200 bucks in my bank account, making 800 bucks to 1,000 bucks a month. That was it. And uh, the question was there, you got a car. And of course I answered yes. Well, when most people say, no, I don't have the money. No, I respected myself. I saw the value and I was resourceful. I did whatever it takes to get that 2,000 bucks to buy a cheap, horrible car that would keep breaking down. But I jumped in and that's how I put myself in a situation to win. Most people don't. They can't think outside the box. They don't go all out. Most people are like, oh, you know what? Even if I did have to try to get that money, you know, then I'd be in a situation where I have to pay it back and, you know, I'd have to do these little jobs. My ego, I'm above that. No. Put your ego aside. Do whatever it takes. That's what I did. Okay? And once more, take action. Respect yourself. Be resourceful. Take action. It's as easy as that. And this is key, especially when not only injecting more money in your life, but surrounding yourself with these people. You want to know why? I'm sure you've heard this saying, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You hear that? Is it true? Yeah, pretty much. Now here's the thing. We all hear that and we're all like, man, 
I want to surround myself with those uh, successful people. They're going to improve my life. But here's where you forget. You know that, but they also know that. And they know that if they start hanging out with you, you're going to bring them down. In order to surround yourself with those people, you have to present some kind of offering. Okay? Whether it's, you know, you could say good vibes, which everyone talks about. You know, good vibes and value in the vibe. Yeah, that's just the basic. That's the baseline. But beyond that, you have to provide some kind of value. Perhaps a skill, perhaps helping them in some area of their life, or even a money, you know, presentation. But that's how you get in there. To do that, you got to be resourceful and once more, take action. Okay? And I want to hit on this point too. Action in terms of surrounding yourself with people, but also action in terms of applying this stuff. Okay? Don't come at this work from the knowledge collector frame of mind. Okay? What does that mean? When you see a new video that pops up and you're about to click on it, you might be excited. You're like, oh, a new Julian video. Here we go. Are you thinking about it like this? Here's a new video. I wonder what advice I can apply to my life. Or are you thinking, ooh, a new video. Maybe there's some uh, stories or knowledge bits that I haven't heard before that I can add to my collection. What are you thinking? For a lot of people, it's the knowledge collecting. You're like, oh, a new story, one for the bag. I have friends like this, people I know. It's like, they, they're like, I've seen every video of every coach and teacher and I know it all. You know, I, there's not a single concept I haven't heard before. And I'm like, great, did you apply any of it? No, but I know it all. I've watched all the videos. I'm like, did you apply it to your life? They're like, no. Okay, once more, it's not about accumulating content. It's about applying the content. The content is not the result. The result is what happens when you take action on that content. So that's the first thing, accountability. Number two, a step-by-step -step system. Okay, it's not just winging it. It's not thinking, oh, the more content I take in. No, it's having a system, a roadmap, if you will, that you can come back to again and again and again. This is the system I use. I call these the levels of transformation. Okay, this is my map. This is what I've seen after traveling around the world since 2010. This is the process of transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly. These are the phases you go through. The very bottom, there's apathy. What is apathy? Apathy is a state of just numbness. Yeah, what's the point? It's not gonna work anyway. It's just kind of given up at the bottom. That's where a lot of people in uh, you know, society reside. Uh, you might have pockets of this. You're like, well, I kind of want to take action on this transformation stuff, but it's probably not going to work for me, so why even try, you know? Look at all the other things I failed in the past. Eh, why, you know, it's probably going to fail again. Eh, whatever, I give up. That's the bottom. As you move up, you get into grief. Grief is the level of victimhood, and there is also a lot of society in there, where instead of being at the bottom where it's like, oh, what's the point? You start believing that you can, so you actually have a little bit more power, a little bit more energy, a little bit more life force in you, but you're not doing it because of something or someone else. So instead of, oh, I can't anyway, it's, well, I could, but, you know, the government did this, and, you know, my friend did this to me, and in my childhood, this thing happened, and I'm such a victim. If I wasn't a victim, I would, but, you know, I'm just a victim. That is grief. Then as you move up, you start dropping that. You start taking responsibility. You start saying, you know what? Maybe I am a victim. Maybe some things did happen, but I could probably still do some stuff. And then fear starts kicking in. And then you're paralyzed by fear. You're like, oh, do I really want to do this? Oh, even entertaining the thought, oh, that's scary. I'm gonna have to really challenge a lot of parts of me. I'm gonna have to jump out of my comfort zone. Is that really what I want? Then you move up to anger. Anger in terms of frustration of not taking action, self-attack, and beating yourself up for all the things you missed in the past. Ah, why didn't I realize this sooner? Why can't I take action? Why does fear keep winning? And then you finally tip into courage, and that's when you jump in. You finally take action. And as you do, then the ego starts kicking in. Maybe you can do this. And you're like, I can. And you move up to desire. 
And that's, ooh, if I keep doing this, I'll show all those people wrong. You know, I'll get the validation, the approval. I'll show Susie, who rejected me in school, who the man really is. And that's the land of the ego. As you move up, you let go of that, and you come at it from a place of more authenticity, you could say. You align with purpose, where instead of acting from a place of need, of craving, of desperation, you transition to acting from a place of inspiration. Instead of being motivated by, say, fear or lust or anger, you're motivated by love. And then as you move up, you're at the top. You're enlightened, you're in love. Okay, you're in a state of full self-acceptance, unconditional love. But this is the process. Okay, this scale reflects the natural sequence of transformation. All of you can identify your default here. You can all pinpoint the level where you're at. Now, we all have a default, but then we all have different pockets. Okay, so what does that mean? If you're in fear, for example, it doesn't mean that you're in fear all the time. Something could perhaps happen where you do take action, and perhaps your ego kicks in, and then you experience a pocket of desire. But the thing is, it's only temporary. Then you find your way back to fear that governs most of your life. Okay, on the flip side, you could be in a state of desire and something happens and then you fall into a pocket of fear or you fall into a pocket of apathy. Perhaps in most of life, you're like, of course I can do it. But then in this one area, uh, what's the point? So you have all these different pockets and a default. You must identify the default and recognize the pockets when you're in them. Okay, the scale reflects the natural sequence, we have a habitual and temporary levels. People fail because they aim too high. This is huge, okay? If you're someone who, for example, is in apathy, and you're like, you know what? I hear all the, this advice on finding your purpose. I wanna find my purpose. Are you gonna find your purpose? No, it's too big of a jump. And because then you fail, you try a few times, and then you give up, and then it reinforces apathy. You can't aim too high. The way it works is aim for the next step. You can think of it as a ladder. Aim for just the next one. If you're in apathy, move up to grief. That's the goal. If you're in apathy and you can suddenly start feeling like a victim and feeling sorry for yourself, that is actually good. Now this challenge is a big idea in the mainstream when it comes to personal transformation, which is transformation is this beautiful unfolding of awesomeness, where how do you know you're doing good? You just feel better and better. That's not true. For someone, for example, who's a victim moving up to fear, that is actually good. But people won't say that. No, fear is bad. It depends on the place it's coming from. If you're someone who's in courage, then you move down to fear, then you could say that's bad. But if you're someone who's in apathy or grief and you move up to fear, that is good. So people fail because they aim too high or they don't know where to aim. And they're actually making progress, but they think they aren't, and then they revert back. Okay, here's an example. Someone in apathy, if you tell them, hey, you know what, you might suck, your life situation may suck, but it's not your fault. You are a victim. Is that good advice or bad advice? Telling someone they're a victim. For someone in apathy, that is amazing advice. What are you talking about? Telling someone they're a victim who are in apathy, that's awesome. That's the best advice you could give them. Why? Because you bump them up to grief. If you feel completely horrible, hearing someone tell you it's not your fault, you feel a little bit of relief you actually feel yourself moving up. Like, oh, it's not my fault, it's the government, it's, the, it's Donald Trump's fault, it's not mine. My life's shitty, I always thought it was my fault that my life was shitty. You're saying it's Trump's fault? Oh, thank you, thank you, I'm just a little victim. Blame, okay, that is actually amazing advice. However, if you hang on to it too long, it'll start eating you up inside. And then you hear advice like, you know what? Take responsibility for your life. Don't be a little victim. Maybe someone did do something to you, or some event did happen that was unfair, but hey, you can't let that define you and confine you. Take responsibility. If there's blame, use that as motivation. Use that hurt as motivation. Is that good advice? Yeah, for someone in that level, that's amazing advice. Then they start moving up into fear and anger. However, what happens if they hang on to that too long? It also eats them up inside. 
And then you hear advice like, hey, instead of being motivated by hurt or even pain or anger, what about letting go of that and just being inspired to take action from a healthier place, being motivated by love? But if you tell that to someone who's in apathy, hey, motivated by love, it won't work because the gap's too big. It's not appropriate to the level. Okay, so remember this. People fail because they aim too high. They don't understand the natural sequence of transformation. And there are different tools for each level. There's different advice for each level. Okay, and this really reconciles in the personal development world a lot of these contradictions. You know, or seemingly contradictions, where it's like, but, but you know, you said be, take responsibility and use that as motivational fuel, but then you also said be motivated by love. Which one is it? It depends for where you're at, for who you're talking to. Different tools, different advice for each level. And another big mistake people make is that they use the wrong tools. They're at a certain level and they're op trying to use the tools of another level. And of course it's not going to work. So you need to know which tools go to each level. The way I personally view it is like I have this little tool belt. And whenever I fall into a pocket of, say, grief, I'm like, oh, I'm in grief right now. I'll pull out the tools for grief. And I'll easily jump out of it. Oh, I'm in fear. Pull out the tools. Oh, I'm in desire. Pull out the tools. This is how you master a personal transformation. And no matter what I'm dealing with, whatever blockage, whatever issue, whatever sticking point, you can always link it to this scale. This is the map. Instead of just being like, well, I'm of this problem and there's all these random videos out there and maybe I'll try this and this. No. Be smart. You must have a map, a step-by-step -step system. Okay? So different tools. Aim for the next one up. And the way you move up is by letting go. And this is why I talk about letting go so much. There are two types of meditation. There's concentration-based meditation and mindfulness-based meditation. Concentration-based is the mainstream form of meditation, where it's like, you know what? Uh, focus on the present moment. Focus on the now. Bing. If you're familiar with Eckhart Tolle. It's the one where you ask someone, like, hey, so do you meditate? They're like, yeah, I meditate. It's part of my morning routine. I just sit there for 20 minutes. Cool. And uh, you can focus on a mantra. You can focus on a spot on the wall. Whatever it is, you're focusing, you're concentrating, and in a way, you're trying to pursue presence. Now, are there benefits to this? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. As opposed to not meditating, this is amazing. Okay? I did that for a few years, and you'll see it. It, it calms you down. Um, you're able to focus on something for a longer period of time. It's a good little escape, a vacation from your problems, but... Here's what I realized. It doesn't really address the problems. Because what happens? Say right now you're stressed. You're like, oh, I'm stressed and there's worry and fear, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the problems. Oh, I want to feel at peace. You know, I want to pursue presence. Focus on the now. There's all the problems and you're focusing on the now. Guess what? If you keep focusing on the now, eventually these problems will start fading away. They're out of your awareness because all your awareness is on the now. But then what happens if you stop focusing on the now? <laughs> right back in the problems. You feel that? It's like, during those 20 minutes, it feels great. But as soon as you're done, it's like, well, I'm back as I was before. That was a good vacation. That's what it is. So that's concentration-based. Mindfulness-based is, instead of pursuing presence, we realize presence. Instead of pursuing peace, we realize peace. How? Instead of focusing on the now, to avoid the problems, we focus on the problems. And then if you process and let go and release those problems, there's nothing pulling you away from the now or peace. Do you get it? The two approaches. Problems, I'm escaping them by focusing on the now. Or, let me focus on the problems, get rid of them, so I'm just present by default. That's mindfulness-based. But it's not very pleasant. Why? Because you're facing all those inner demons. You're facing the problems the things you're trying to get rid of by focusing on the now, by pursuing presence. And we're so used to escaping, we don't want to face those inner demons. There's compounded resistance around facing your inner problems. You've been running away from them your entire life. 
You know, this is probably why you're even in personal development, to fix the problems, run away from the problems. Mindfulness meditation is stop, turn, jump into the problems in order to let go of them. Focus on the stuff that's not that pleasant in order to free yourself from it. Focus on the past to free yourself from the past. Now here you hear advice too. Well, no, you know, if you focus on the past, what's gonna happen? You're gonna stay stuck in the past. Keep your eye on the future, right? But here's the thing, if you don't address that, you're just gonna keep recreating it in the future. It doesn't mean stay stuck on the past, it's focus on it and let go of it. Okay, the same with negative thoughts. A big um, movement, which I'm sure you're aware of, is the law of attraction movement, or the positive thinking movement, right? Think positive thoughts. Now, depending on where you're at on the map, that can be amazing. If you're someone who is in a lot of self-hate and self-attack and you just feel horrible, telling that person to proactively think positively will actually give them some relief. But it doesn't truly get to the cause. Okay, you can try to convince yourself as much as you want, I'm positive, I'm positive, but there still might be that little voice in the background saying, no you're not, you loser. Your mom should have aborted you. No, I'm positive, I'm positive. You gotta address that. And here's the thing with the law of attraction. Whether that's true or not, based on my experience and what I've seen, I believe it's definitely true. Um, here's the thing, thoughts are active out of your awareness. If you're like, I'm positive, but they're still in the background, no, you're not, that's active. And that's why the law of attraction doesn't work for so many people. You ever find it funny? You know, think positive thoughts and you'll manifest positive things. Yet you go to these events of law of attraction and it's filled with losers. It's like, well, wait a minute, where is all this manifestation, yo? Well, I just gotta do it a few more years. <laughs> no, it's because you don't address the stuff in the background the stuff that's out of your awareness. Don't use positive thinking as a way to escape negativity. Positive thinking isn't something that you should do, it should just be the default when you let go of negative thinking. But to let go of it, you must focus on it. Make sense?